Hello, people. And um, thank you very much for coming, for staying for the last session. I appreciate it. It's, um, it's been two very long days, very exhausting days. So I'm grateful that you've, um, that you've made the effort to come to the very last one. Thank you. And um, can I ask first, um, have you enjoyed the conference? Yes. Yeah, I, I have as well. I, I was, yeah, more, more than I expected, to be honest. I've really learned quite a lot. I'm, uh, I'm quite excited about the last couple of days. And the other thing I want to know while I'm asking questions of the audience is how many of you are, have a background in embedded software? Wow. That's more than half. Now, I'd, I did not expect that, honestly, in a Jenkins conference. Um, so the first thing I expected to have to do was to explain what embedded software is. Um, so we can skip past that bit a little bit faster than I expected to. <laughs> Good. Um, so let's get started. Um, so that's what it's about. Um, I, I should say why I've said non-standard use case is to uh, explain to you um, what it's not about. Um, we don't deliver continuously. Uh, we, we don't do DevOps. We are, in that sense, we're rather an old-fashioned shop. We have a software product that the user installs on their computer and runs, and we make releases every two or three months. Um, depending on what's going on and what needs to be done. But we aren't part of the exciting new world of continuous delivery. Um, so from, in Jenkins' terms, that makes us non-standard, I think. But uh, I hope particularly people coming from the hardware um, world will uh, find something of value in what we do. Um, so setting the scene. Um, I'm going to give you just a brief uh, overview of what our software product is so that you understand the problem that we are using Jenkins to solve. Um, the, the purpose of this talk is not to promote our software product. It's, it's not anything to do with Jenkins or the Jenkins world, but you need to understand roughly what it is in order to, to know what, where, we, where we are. So, um, well, setting the scene in the other sense. Um, Cambridge likes cows. Um, this is a real picture. It's not photoshopped. They do graze in front of King's College Chapel. Um, we have a little custom hardware gadget that we put together. You'll see in a few slides time. It's very homemade. Um, it needed a name, and we can't just call them the custom hardware gadget, that one, and the custom hardware gadget, that one. It had to have a short and concise name. And since they all live in a test farm, I said that they are going to be cows, and that's what they are. Right. So this is our software product. Um, this is the kind of standard slide that you would um, that, that we would put in presentations to our customers. But um, it's uh, basically it's an IDE. Uh, it's um, it's it's Eclipse really, and the uh, and it's got GCC and GDB inside it. So far, so free software and not our achievement. It just is. But we have added a lot of uh, ease of use for NXP's customers uh, who, are, who are developing embedded software on NXP microcontrollers and quite often are not uh, primarily software developers. They may be people who are more at home uh, designing hardware boards, designing gadgetry, and they want to write a small amount of software to make their hardware work. They are not right, architecting huge software installations. So we have a lot of stuff in our product to make life easy for them. Um, so templates to help them get started and that kind of thing. And the other end of it um, is that we have uh, the ability to uh, run and debug software on, on an actual microcontroller, which of course doesn't have much in the way of communication to the outside world. So most of what our product, most of the value our product gives them is that they can sit at their computer, which will be a Windows PC, a Macintosh, or a Linux PC, and they can run the debugger and say, run, and the software, I'll show you in a couple of slides a picture to illustrate this, and the software will not be running on the host computer, but it'll be running on the development board that they're trying to um, Develop for so yeah this, this is uh, this is how it, how it is um, here's the user 
Uh, here's the user's PC or Macintosh or whatever it might be. This, uh, it, it's running our package, which is called LPC Expresso. Part of LPC Expresso is called the debug stub, and that's a bit of software that communicates via USB cable to a hardware gadget called a debug probe. And that communicates via a debug interface to development board, which has a microcontroller fitted to it. And they are, they are using this to develop and debug their software while they're also uh, designing the hardware that they eventually... And I, for people who don't know what embedded software is, and the result of all this is going to be a system that might be built into a car or a washing machine or a gadget of some kind, a mobile phone. Um, it, it's not... Uh, it's not going into a computer that you would think of as a computer on your desk. I'm no, sorry, that, that, that's embedded software for beginners, for those who have no idea what it is. I don't know how many of those there are in the audience. Um, so this is LPC Expresso. This is our product. Um, we have parts of it that come to us as public releases. Um, that's Eclipse. We get that directly from the Eclipse Foundation. Nothing for us to do. They've tested it and built it. Uh, we have uh, GNU tools, which uh, we actually take a version that's built by ARM. And so it's already tested and op optimized for the ARM processor. Um, and we have layers of software that we add to the product ourselves. So I've put our logo against it to show the, the bits that it's our responsibility to build and test. And the bit that we're most interested in today is this bit, the debug stub, um, which is communication layer between our product, the IDE, and the development boards. Um, so this is what um, the main part of the talk is going to be about, is how we use Jenkins to test the debug stubs. Um, so to start with, um, this is uh, one of my colleagues, this is his desk, this is, uh, I hope, a bewildered expression, um, which he has um, not adopted for the camera. Uh, it's, it's how you feel when you're faced with the prospect of many, many different debug probes, target boards, and host computers that have to be driven. The, the number of combinations is huge. We'll get to the hugeness of it, of it soon. And to make it worse, many of them are not compatible with each other. You can't just plug several into the USB sockets of your uh, computer and say, OK, I'll, t I'll talk to this one, then I'll talk to that one, then I'll talk to that one, and then I'll have tested those three. It's not that simple. Um, to test manually, you, go, you keep on having to unplug cables, replug cables, and um, reboot the boards. Um, testing manually is very tedious and very time consuming and you can't really. Um, so this is just to show you the scale of the testing problem. This, what you see here is a subset of the problem. Um, so the list down the side is uh, different kinds of target microcontroller. Um, some of them are the same microcontroller with d different editions, different flash memory or whatever on, on the board with them. And these are different kinds of debug probe um, called imaginatively LPC Link, LPC Link 2, and similar, similar names. We currently support five kinds, and some of those come in flavors because they have different kinds of firmware in them as well. Um, new targets are constantly being added. Hardware designers are constantly designing new hardware. It's not just perversity, it's, also, it's improvement. Um, and it's targeting particular specialized applications. Um, new uh, microcontrollers are not general purpose computers, although they've got an ARM processor in them, they are designed for a purpose. So uh, hardware designers keep on designing new ones for different purposes, and our debugging environment has to be able to talk to, to all of them and to all of the old ones as well. We can't upgrade and leave the old ones behind. We have customers who are still working with the old ones, so we, we have to support a huge number. Um, similarly with the probes, there are new designs of probe, but we have plenty of customers who are happy with the probe they've got and don't want to upgrade to a new one, and we've got to support all of that. Um, and besides that, we are supporting our users on uh, three 
different main host platforms, Windows, Linux, Macintosh, and of course there are versions of those operating systems, and we need to make sure that our software works on Windows 7 and Windows 8.1 at the moment. We're going to have to need to test it on Windows 10 as soon as, soon as we've got um, that in going, um, and so on. We, there are, there's Fedora, there's Ubuntu. Um, we need a lot of testing. Um, so this, I hope, is not news to anybody. It's a Jenkins conference. It's pretty hopeless. For, you know, we have a release cycle. As I said, we are fairly traditional. We don't uh, release our software continuously, but it is hopeless doing all the testing just at the end of the release cycle. You don't find the problems easily. Um, people made a mistake six weeks ago. They, they've forgotten what they did. They've broken something. You, don't, you, you lose an awful lot of time and an awful lot of effort and head-scratching, um, saying to somebody, look, this doesn't work on, on this obscure microcontroller that hardly anybody now uses, but some customers still do, because of some other change that you made six weeks ago. Uh, if you can say to them immediately, the, the, we did a build, we, ran, we tested on that microcontroller, you broke it yesterday, look at what you did yesterday, and um, mend your ways. Um, then they are, they're going to find it a lot quicker and there's going to be much less disruption. But um, I mean, we, we all know that. That's, this is um, the continuous, um, continuous development. Um, it's also worth pointing out that the, the debug stubs, although many, the, there are several distinct debug stub binaries, they share common code. So it's very easy to break one by editing, break one when you're trying to change another one. Um, it, it, it's a mistake that uh, experienced developers are still making, and it's not something that you can get around just by disciplined coding practices. It's something that has got to be tested for. Um, it's also worth pointing out that although the stubs have common code, they are very low-level software. They are at the level of a device driver, so they're installed on the host operating system, the Windows, the Mac, the Linux, at a low level, and they interact with the host operating system. So you can't expect to test the Windows version of a debug stub and expect the Macintosh version to work um, because, uh, because it's, it's passed the win tests on Windows. You've got to test it on all platforms, um, build it for all platforms. There's enough host-specific stuff in there that you've got to do that. Okay, I think I've done that one to test. Um, so the solution, obviously, is to use Jenkins. Um, so it, to start with, we build the product. Um, uh, building the product, I could, I could enlarge on for a whole other talk, but that's a different thing. Um, we end up with three uh, versions of the installer. The installer is, is a huge thing, traditional um, install your software, uh, unzip this thing and run the installer. Um, we then uh, we run a job in Jenkins called test install, and that is a matrix. Um, it uses the copy artifact to pick up the correct installer for the particular um, host machine that it's running on. Uh, and then it runs the installer silently, which took a bit of doing. We have to subvert the security on the host machine that is the Jenkins slave um, in various different ways, depending on the platform, so that an installer can run silently and actually install without putting up, are you sure, and um, give me the root password, and all of the other dialogues you normally get when you, when you run an installer. Um, and it checks the results. The checking of the results is not trivial. <laughs> The Windows version of LPC Expresso consists of 7,761 distinct files. I wrote that number down in my notes because I cannot remember it. This, of course, changes um, as um, people change, as we drop in a new release of GCC, there'll be a huge upheaval in the product contents checklist. Um, but also, day to day, we have new ideas about extra configuration files that we want to drop in and so on. Some of these files change their name with every build. Um, the Eclipse files particularly, that's how Eclipse works. The, it um, Im embeds the date into the file name. So just checking the product contents against a checklist is a non-trivial task. And um, I've got Python scripts that um, do clever stuff with wildcards to check the 
contents to um, complain if the product has changed. Well, to flag if the product has changed. And then I go to whichever developer um, I suspect um, made the change and say, did you mean that file to go away? Did you mean this new file to come in? Or has something gone wrong? Until we had the checklists, we could not confidently change the product because it, it, you can't eyeball 7,000 files and be sure that they are all in the right places and that they are all the right versions of what they should be. Um, okay, so the next, the, the important part of the testing of the stub is um, a huge range of combinations of targets and probes. So there's a big, big matrix job. Um, so on one axis, this is a multi-dimensional matrix, or at least conceptually. It doesn't quite work like that in practice. But um, it, there's a big two-dimensional matrix, and then there are separate invocations of a parameterized job to make the other dimensions. Um, so each testing slave, that is, um, the hosts that have LPC Espresso on them that are defined as, as slaves of our Jenkins master, um, can use every kind of debug probe to communicate with the boards, and um, each slave can execute a set of standard images compiled for each kind of target hardware, that is, each, uh, each, micro each target microcontroller. Um, it, that doesn't sound as though you've done much when you've just taken a set of standard images and executed them, but in fact, in terms of testing the debug stub, you've done lots, um, because by the time you have executed a binary image on the target, m m target microcontroller. You have opened communication via the debug probe to the target microcontroller. You've downloaded software, the binary, through those wires, and you've downloaded a command to the, to the debug probe that says go, and you've run on the target microcontroller, and you've harvested the results which might be uh, written by, I mean, typically these, these jobs might just do a printf, but it's a, printer, it's a clever kind of printf that sends its result all the way back via the wire and the other wire all the way back to the host computer. So back comes hello world or whatever the printf might be saying in response to this particular test, and you compare that against what it should be and raise a flag if it's different. By the time you've done that, you've execute, exercised a vast amount of the code in the debug stub. Um, so it, it's a test that is worth doing, and it's a test that, that, that shows a lot of problems if it, um, routinely. Um, if it, it's a test that, 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 that raises flags. Um, have I? Yes, that's all I want to say about that slide. Um, so the snag um, is, as I mentioned earlier when we were talking about manual testing, is that each test board, each, each development board expects to be the star of the show. Each board expects to be connected to the host computer via the debug probe. It does not expect to be one of many. And a lot goes wrong if you try to uh, have them coexist with each other. Some of them are OK, some of them aren't. But by the time you've um, eliminated the ones that don't live happily together, uh, for good documented reasons and aren't expected to live happily together, um, you, you've wasted an awful lot of time um, suspecting problems in your software that aren't there. The only way to test all of this stuff is to um, have one target board and probe combination live uh, attached to one host computer at a time. Um, so the answer, this is a cow. Uh, cow stands for collection of wires. I'm, um, one, I, 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 that's retrofitted, the acronym, I have to say. Um, but it's quite a neat way of uh, making it look so that's what we meant it to be all along. Um, so I will explain. We don't need to go into great detail about the anatomy of the cow. I, um, the important thing is that this is an Ethernet connection there. And that's how we communicate with the cow. Um, we send, uh, we open a telnet session essentially to the cow. It's a simplified, simplified version of telnet. And we send commands via telnet. And the commands are things like turn on switch number one, 
turn on switch number two, switch off all the switches, that kind of thing. So um, a little bit more detail about the anatomy of the cow. Um, this is an off-the-shelf switchable USB hub. The USB cable from a particular host computer, one of the Windows, Linux, Macintosh, Jenkins slaves, comes to there. That's a bit in the shadows you can't see. Um, and these USB outputs go to various different um, debug probe target board combinations. Um, this one isn't fully populated. There are a couple of missing, uh, missing connections. Um, the rocker switches are overridden. You, you can still actually use them manually if you want to do manual testing, uh, but norm, in normal use, the, the rocker switches don't do anything. Instead, these wires here send, uh, have been soldered on underneath, and these relays drive the signal, uh, drive, drive the power to the relevant switch. And this board here is actually or started life as one of our standard development boards. Um, this is, I suppose, eating our own dog food. We, um, we have our own um, software, um, which we've downloaded into this board, which is mostly an open source, um, uh, an open source stack for supporting the Ethernet protocol and uh, a, a simplified version of the Telnet program, which, uh, we, which responds to um, the commands that we send. Um, and that drives the relays via those wires. So it's the three separate items. That's enough about the, uh, the anatomy of the cow, I think. If, you, if you're interested to know more, I'm sure um, I, you can ask at the end. But, um, so this is a much simplified view of the test farm. So here's the Jenkins master. These are physical computers. I'm, I, everybody else's slaves are in the cloud or virtual. Ours are not. Uh, the software that drives the hardware, the low-level stuff, is not very happy on virtual machines. And these are actual boxes. Um, so I've called them here test Windows, test Mac, test Ubuntu. That's uh, slightly simpler because there were, there were more different ones, um, different versions of Windows and so on. Um, but they all, they all run as slaves to the Jenkins master. So there are several more across there. Um, these are the cows, and the cows are named for famous cows in fiction. So we have Ermintrude, Daisy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they are connected via USB to the... To the, to the Jenkins slaves. And each cow, and I haven't drawn in all the arrows because it would just make the diagram too spaghetti-like, which is actually our machine room is very spaghetti-like. So, um, as a, uh, but I've simplified it from, from the diagram. Uh, each cow has, as I showed you in the previous, in the photograph, has the potential to connect uh, six or seven um, USB um, connections. So here, Daisy has several connected, and Willow has several connected. Poppy, in fact, would have several connected as well, but I, I couldn't fit all the hours in. And there are many more of these. Um, okay, so uh, uh, this is a photograph of part of the herd. Um, each of these, these black um, assemblies here has got a cow sitting on top. The blue glow is from the um, LEDs on the cow. Um, and mostly the development boards that are attached to each cow are tidily uh, stacked underneath in, in, on the little black shelves. Um, so there are several development boards and um, development boards and probes attached to, um, attached to each of the cows. Uh, down here at the bottom of the picture, you can just see um, the... Uh, does that show when I move the cursor? I hope it does. You can just see some of the test machines, test, test Windows 7, test Windows 8.1, and so on. Uh, they're all sitting in a row on the bottom of the, of the, of the shelf. Um, and this is uh, an expatriate cow. I, I had a trip to California recently, and I took Marigold with me and set her up. Um, the, we have... Um, so Marigold at the moment only has one board and probe combination attached, uh, but we'll have several more. This laptop is, uh, is a slave to our, um, our Jenkins master in Cambridge, so we are driving this slave remotely across the pond. It's a, it's a Windows 7 laptop at the moment. It'll be upgraded in due course. Um, and 
it appears it will appear to our Jenkins master exactly as a slave. I'm, I'm still sorting out some issues with the software at the moment. But um, we have um, one debug stub developer in the San Jose office. That was the reason for doing this, and. It's very difficult to explain to him remotely over the phone, look what you did. You checked in some code last night. You've broken the Mac version. He's a Windows guy. And um, we, uh, we decided the best way um, of, of making things easy was to have part of the farm local to him so that um, he can also so that he can manually run the software that we, that we run from Jenkins. But, uh, but it's... Jenkins looks after it for him. Jenkins will um, install the software um, after each product build and will run tests on that cow as well. Um, so down to some detail about how we manage all of this. Um, the, the, the cows are plugged into the host machine via USB. Um, that means, of course, that you can unplug them and plug them into different ones, and you probably want to, because you want to extend the test coverage um, by taking the cow that's normally on Linux and trying to see whether the boards that are on that cow will work on the Macintosh. We don't have m infinite number of copies of all the different boards, and we don't have room for them all either. Um, so we have a job called Configure Test Farm, and it's just a, a parameterized job. This is a screenshot of what you get when, when, you, when you build this job. Um, and what you get on, on the build with parameters screen. Um, so this has got uh, one parameter per cow in the farm and a drop down to select which of the test machines that cow is connected to today. And it defaults to the standard configuration. We have a standard configuration, otherwise it would be mind bogglingly complicated. But um, this is when you, when you reconfigure the farm, you run this job manually in Jenkins to tell Jenkins what you've done to the farm. Um, and after this job is run, this is the result page of that job. And I'm using the summary display plugin in Jenkins, uh, which is nice because uh, I produce some XML. And the summary display plugin converts that XML into this um, HTML, um, which is embedded in the job um, in the output from the job in Jenkins. So these are sortable columns. Um, these are targets. Um, these are uh, debug probes across the top. So, we, so this shows the matrix of targets and probes which are, which are possible. And it shows, in fact, which test machines they are connected to. These are the names of the test machines. Uh, so you can see... Um, how the test coverage is looking on this particular day. And so you can glance at this and see where the gaps are, which, which combinations of target and probe are not being exercised on which platform. Um, so we get some sense of how the debug stub testing is going to be done. Um, I was interested in the... Um, Jenkins user interface talk yesterday, I don't know if anyone else was there, um, that they are going to be bringing in sortable columns and so on as part of the standard Jenkins. But uh, in the meantime, the summary display plugin is extremely useful for this kind of thing. Um, OK, so test jobs, when, for the test jobs to run, they, every test job picks up the artifact from this configure test farm job that we, that we ran um, to produce that display. Um, that produces, as well as the XML for the display, it also produces a text file um, which expresses how the farm is configured. Um, and every test job gathers up that file using the copy artifact plugin before it runs. So every test job before it runs knows the current state of the farm. Um, and I have uh, another job called the test results aggregator. After every test job runs, it produces a new line in this, in this matrix. This is the top of a very long list. Um, at present, we've got 151 of lines being generated from this every time we do a product build. Each one represents a run of the standard image tests on a platform. A host platform, a Jenkins slave, which is a host platform uh, with a particular target and probe and a few more refinements that I haven't gone into because there's too much detail. Um, for instance, which kind of firmware, some of the 
probes uh, can be boosted with different kinds of firmware. Um, so this result overview shows the retry column is interesting. Uh, a, couple of the, a couple of them needed one retry before they succeeded in booting the target board. Um, don't know why. Um, the, and a couple of them failed. This column shows how many tests passed, how many failed. Um, so uh, I express it as the number of failures, which, so it's zero and green if, if, um, it, if nothing failed. Um, we see a couple of lines where, where we got failures. Um, these here are live links. Um, so for each line, you can click on one of these links, and that will take you to more detail about the test results. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a bit more about how, what that looks like later. Um, so just as an aside, we use something called the robot framework to define the tests. Um, it's nice because it runs on all of our platforms, and it integrates with Python. I'm a big Python fan, so I, I write a lot of my, my stuff in Python. Um, and it produces some rather nice HTML output with no effort. Uh, there's also a Jenkins plugin to display the re um, results from it. Um, so, just looking where there's in, yes. And yes, it will also produce, its, um, produce some results as environment variables. So, um, the, the test jobs um, pick up um, those environment variables and use them, um, for example, um, to generate, when I, I'm using the extend, email extension plugin, and I can use those environment variables to um, report the number of test failures to my users in the email that's generated when tests fail. And um, if a lot of tests fail, they uh, accuse me of generating spam. But they are, at least they are being alerted really fast when something is going wrong. Um, so the live links that I mentioned in the results table lead to a re report that looks like this. And I've, I've clicked on one that failed, obviously, so we're seeing a lot of red. Uh, in this particular case, one test failed. And we can see immediately what it was. It was the mass arrays test. Um, that one just erases the flash memory on the, on, the, on the test board. Curiously, the other, um, the, more, the more complicated tests work, but the mass arrays fail, which is a little odd. Um, so we drill down a bit more. We can click on these things. These are live. And it takes us down to a detail screen, which shows really gory detail. This is the output that comes back from the debug stub. It's not really meant to be human parsable and not by the end user. Um, this is parsed by our IDE to um, present nice results to our users. But when we're debugging, we need to see what it said. Um, and in this particular case, it went all the way down to a message, IO error, cable disconnected, question mark, which gives us a big clue as to what might have been wrong in this particular case. So we get to that just by two or three clicks. Um, so I'm going to show, um, this is a little bit of video to show a cow in action being driven by software. It's very short. Um, but as you see, nobody's clicking the switches. The cow um, switches on and indeed switches off. And uh, in a moment, I think another one will switch on. Yes. Well, you get the idea. Um, yeah. This is slightly more exciting bit of video. Um, it's another cow. It's slightly dark. I'm sorry about that. Um, oh, sorry. I went the wrong place. I clicked the wrong button. That's what I wanted to okay. meant to click. OK, so there it goes. So the cow, um, the light switched on there, and that made the development board switch on as well. And um, that's, yeah, and switch off again. Good. OK, that's enough of that. Um, yeah, that, that's how the cows work. We, we have other bits of automation in our testing, which uh, we like to show. Um, at the front end, we have project templates that our users use to, uh, to generate their software. And there are lots. We, we create these in a Jenkins job, which goes mix and match lots of um, different software components to make up the, uh, the project wizards, um, the project templates for our, for our customers to use for their purposes. Um, that that it means there's a huge testing overhead because we've got to test them all. The, as a side effect of the job that creates the templates, um, we also produce uh, a set of robot tests which are 
which will load them into the IDE, launch the IDE, load into the IDE, um, compile and produce a binary and exit the IDE. By the time we've done that, and again, that's not, a, that's not by any means exhaustive testing of the IDE, but it shows that it starts up, it shows that it has a compiler in it, that the compiler compiles, and that the linker links, and that it produces a result, um, which is a nice smoke test for each time we do a, the product build. Um, and again, that one, uh, in a minute anyway, we'll... Uh, We'll show you it working. Yeah, so I've, I have the keyboards in shots so that you can see that this, uh, this stuff is being driven remotely. It's not actually, uh, not actually being uh, driven by a user. That's probably all you need to see for that. It, uh, it gets a bit repetitive after a while. Um, yeah, so d apart from that, we, uh, we, we do various other automated things, which are, for instance, uploading the build artifacts so that other part people in the group can do it using... Um, yeah. This is all using plugins in Jenkins, this um, SSH um, plugin. Um, and we... A nice one, I think, is uh, we have a shared cloud server where, which is a slave to our Jenkins, and it's also a slave to a Jenkins master elsewhere. Uh, a long way away, actually. Um, they, um, our colleagues in, this is in uh, Washington State, want to run their software on our test farm. Um, so they produce a zip file, they upload it from their Jenkins master via, um, to, to the shared cloud server, which is defined as being a slave on their master. We see the file come into existence, we poll for its existence, and we also have a slave to our master, which is defined on the same, um, uh, which is defined on the same on the same cloud server. They're two Jenkins slaves, um, and our slave fetches the resulting file and triggers a job that runs on the test farm. This, of course, because of the time difference, is using our test farm in the night. So they are. Uh, their software typically uh, would be finished at the end of their working day, which is in the middle of the night for us, so um, that makes some efficient use of uh, rather scarce resources of the... Uh, because the test setup is hand-built, um, it isn't of infinite size, and to make use of it by the groups is useful. Um, that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, the, this is the obligatory uh, favourite plug-in slide. Everybody has one of these. Um, some of them I, I'll give a bit more detail about um, subsequent slides. But, uh, exclusion I'll talk about a bit more, and also the matrix combinations. Um, conditional build steps are essential. Um, the, yeah, I'll talk a bit more about matrix jobs as well in a, in a, in a while, because that's terribly important, because of the way our, our world is. Um, build timeout. If you have um, the debug stub hanging, then um, there's a very useful plugin which times out um, the uh, times out a job running on the slave and reports that the job failed rather than leaving it hanging, which it w was the default behavior. Um, and green balls, of course, everybody's favorite. Um, I, I haven't listed, or, and we've got a lot of plugins installed. We may be a little undisciplined about plugins. We've got too many, um, but I've, I, and I won't list the ones that provide the obvious functionality that everybody uses. But um, Subversion, for instance, I mean, that wouldn't be interesting. Um, so we do a lot with build parameters. Uh, we have parameterized jobs for source code checkout and so on. Um, uh, most of this I'll cover later on, so um, yeah, skip that. Okay, um, the the big matrix jobs. Um, the essence of it is that it's sparse, as I've explained. We haven't got everything all connected to every uh, every testing slave at once, um, and it was running the big test matrix. Uh, to say, have you got the right hardware connected? No, oh, oh well then, come back. Uh, was slow, was inefficient, and um, was ugly. Uh, so uh, we have a, a second job called launch test matrix, 
which runs a Python script, which inquires about the state of the farm. So it, take, it picks up the file that I mentioned, which is a, a, a text file which describes the current state of the farm, which cow is connected to which slave, um, and it generates a properties file. So um, here we're picking up um, the properties file um, and injecting it into this job as environment variables. And then we are triggering the actual test job, the, the test matrix job, um, using the said environment variable, which we just picked up out of that, out of that properties file. Um, and I will... Uh, there. There's an example of why you don't want to do this by hand. This is, um, this is the environment variable combinations, which, is, uh, I'll go back, um, is actually used there, dollar combinations. Um, and that's... Uh, a typical example of what it looks like um, when you um, consider what's actually connected to the farm and translate that into an appropriate variable. This will then, um, the test matrix job has a matrix combinations parameter as one, that, as, as one of its parameters. And a matrix combinations parameter expects something that looks like this. And that selects which items in the test matrix are actually going to run when the big matrix job runs. So that's a huge time saver when you're working with a sparse matrix. Um, the other thing I want to highlight is uh, exclusion. Um, so uh, you could do this with throttling actually as well, but um, the way I've done it is with um, the Jenkins exclusion plugin. Um, so we have something called dollar slave boards. Um, so the particular Jenkins slave that is LPC Expresso host, that we are um, running these tests on, um, we claim the board, or the board, which is attached to that, um, to that slave. So other jobs that may run on that slave to test other aspects of the, of the software um, um, may run, but other jobs that want also to use, a, use test hardware to, to talk to a debug probe and, and a target board um, will have to wait on the, on the exclusion. Um, so we claim it before running each test, and then it supports a, it within the Jenkins job a, a critical region, and we release the resource at the end of the job. So, um, right. so a bit about... Uh, Jenkins and uh, our relationship with it. Um, we love Jenkins, we do. Um, but um, there are ways in which support for matrix jobs is a little bit lacking. And one example of that, um, I, I don't know if other people use permalinks, um, promoted builds, no? <coughs> but we do. <laughs> um, we, we use the build promotion to, uh, to label particular uh, important builds, ones that we want to test, or ones that are experimental, or ones that are release candidates, whatever. And we want to use copy artifact to fetch the appropriate artifacts from the promoted build. Uh, and we find it doesn't work properly with matrix jobs. And I'm afraid that that is something of the story with matrix jobs in Jenkins. Um, I, they don't seem to be first-class citizens. Um, very often we find when we upgrade Jenkins that something's gone wrong with the matrix jobs. They, um, at the moment, for instance, and the Jenkins that we're using, which are, we're not quite up to the latest long L LTS, but we almost are, um, the description setter plugin, which is lovely, which shows uh, after each run you can put a message so on the list of, uh, uh, of results from, um, from running a job, you can, you can annotate them. But it doesn't work properly with matrix jobs. Um, since the last upgrade, it's messed up with matrix jobs. Um, I, with source code branches, um, I would like a Jenkins job to be able to pull the source and, and build from, build and know about branches. Um, so I, I have one job. Um, that's going to build on two different branches, and I want it to um, build, um, build branch A when um, somebody's checked work into branch A, and build branch B when somebody's checked into... Uh, and, and the polling doesn't actually work like that. And you can work around it, but... Um, the other thing I wanted to say, I'm sure everybody uh, agrees with this, yes, that automated is good, but 
Um, scripted is so much better. Uh, I just want to give uh, a flavour of our complexity. This was created with the Jenkins Dependency Graph plugin, and it shows what our job structure, part of our job structure, and we have more than that, what it looks like. Jobs that call other jobs, jobs that copy artefacts from other jobs. Um, and they're all defined in the Jenkins GUI, and it's becoming unmanageable. And I'm very excited about the workflow plugin, which I believe is going to be my salvation. Um, but, as I say, uh, um, it allows the complicated structure to, um, to be expressed as scripts. Um, so scripts are better. You can, you can see what's going on in a script. You can read it, whereas all this configuration spread all over the Jenkins GUI is, is unmanageable. Um, and we can check them into source control, all these good things. But I'm a bit worried about support for matrix jobs. When we... Um, I came to the Workflow plugin uh, workshop a few months ago, and it did seem that support for matrix jobs was not really there yet. I don't know whether it is now, but I'm, I'm, I'm yes, I'm hoping. Um, so just to recap, uh, yes, it's a matrix world, and um, and it's a reconfigurable matrix world, a sparse matrix. So uh, Jenkins has to be uh, flexible as well. Um, we use a lot of features of Jenkins to manage this complexity, and we need matrix jobs to work. Um, OK, that's it. That's me. Um, gosh, finished almost on the Wow. I didn't expect that. I <laughs> finished almost on the dot. Mm.